This episode of Linux Action Show is brought to you by GoDaddy.com. And by Ting.com. Head over to last.ting.com and save $25 off your first device. Welcome to the Linux Action Show, Season 26, Episode 7. My name is Chris. My name is Matt. Hey, Matt. Good hey. morning to you. Morning. Should I tell folks about the big show? I'm looking forward to it. All right, here's what we have coming up. It's our Ubuntu 1304 review this mm. week, and I will tell you, is the Ubuntu 1304 maybe the best Ubuntu ever, or a big snore fest? Hmm. Stay mm. tuned for that. Plus, in the news segment, we'll talk about cats and dogs working together. Yeah, that's right. The big desktop projects have gotten together and agreed on some common standards. We'll tell you about those. Plus how open source is sort of spreading organically throughout the world to dominate everything. And uh, then we have an awesome Etsy segment where I'm going to sit down and chat with a fellow community member who makes a smaller distribution. And I think, you know, in reflection of reviewing the big dog. I think it's really good. I think it's, it's fantastic to actually have that comparison right. and contrast. We're right? going gonna, we're gonna to gonna review the big dog, and then we'll mm -hmm. talk to somebody. What's his inspiration for going yeah. up against the big dogs and making, you know, a small independent distribution? Totally. So that'll be in the slash Etsy. Mm -hmm. Then we've got an epic feedback segment and much, much more. It's a big show. Woohoo! All right, Matt, why don't you why don't we start off this big show with the picks? What do you say? Uh, let's do it. Do All it. right, let's do it. Let's do it. Do it. My uh, runs Linux this pick is a fanless micro server that runs Linux. Now check Ooh, this thing out. Shiny. It's pretty slick looking and it's got fins on it for heat dissipation, kind of like a race car. And uh, here's a couple of interesting facts about it. The device consumes 8 to 35 watts of power. It's related for uh, it's uh, rated for operation in uh, tw negative 20 degrees Celsius up to 60 degrees Celsius. Wow. Requires no fans, no ventilation holes, mm. has HDMI, display port, multiple gigabit Ethernet ports, USB 3.0, Wi-Fi, wow. uh, Wi-Fi 802.11n, eSATA, digital audio, and... It's pretty cool. A Core i7 processor. I kind of want one. I kind of want one. The Core i7 processor is what sold me. It's got, uh, yeah. you can, you know, so this is a full-fledged... For a little solid-state machine like that, that's yeah. pretty uh, That's pretty tight. <laughs> Running Linux, man. Yeah. And it goes up to, uh, you can get uh, with the third-generation Core i7, which is really, which is awesome. And then you get you also the Intel 4000 graphics, which is going to be, like, more than enough for any kind of embedded, oh, yeah. like, media display center or something like that. Mm -hmm. Hey, this is tons. Ah, oh, dude, this is awesome. And I like the eSATA, too, for extra storage. The thing makes a really cool little server. Now, pricing, mm. if you want to buy in bulk, is going to start around 556 mm. for volume orders, according to okay. CompuLab. So it's probably a, maybe closer in the $700 range. Mm. I'm, I'm going to totally guess mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. Somewhere for single unit. Also has mini PCIe. I, you know, this is really cool. This, this could is, be a really yeah, I mean, good little At first, server. the price kind of seemed a little sticky, but after a while, it's kind of like, you know, I think if you really want something of that form factor and you want it to not be a piece of crap yeah. this is really the way to go they call it the usvr you know? the usvr it's see and it yeah. also has uh you can get a model that has external antenna ports for wi-fi well see this oh now see i'm liking this more and more you this keep adding be, these features and it's yeah. just like really this could make cool. a good this could make a good little firewall too I mean, it'd be pretty powerful for a firewall but. so this is essentially to recap this is fanless mm -hmm. this has got decent specs yeah you can uh, wi-fi this all day long yeah uh pfft. Hey, you know. Yeah. The chat room is, uh, as the chat room points out, uh, CompuLab, they make good stuff. They're based in Israel, mm -hmm. uh, and it's called a microserver. And I should mention, wow. the Linux Action Show is live on Sundays at 10 a.m. Pacific yes. over at jblive.tv. Yep. Yeah. Yes. And uh, it's fun if you join us live because we not only do we have about twice as much show as what actually gets released, mm -hmm. uh, but we also have the live chat room. They always like to hang out and read their questions and respond to as the show goes. So welcome. It's Oh, thank you for pointing out that yeah. it's 5 p.m. GMT. There yes, you it go. is. Yes, it is. And we've been known to do events from time to time as well. Yeah. Oh, well, speaking of events, we got a little bit about that coming up. We got a big event next weekend. I think if things work out, we're going to be live all day Saturday next mm -hmm. weekend. We'll tell you about that. But first, I want to thank this week's sponsor, GoDaddy.com. GoDaddy.com. And, uh, you know, you guys all know that the Linux Action Show, close personal friends with Danica Patrick. Big time. Big time. You big know, time. at first, there was a bit of a barrier. Uh, and I'm going to be honest, it was my fault. Uh, I used to say Danica Kirkpatrick. <laughs> she thought it was adorable, though. It worked out. It, it made us closer. And uh, so since then, since we've, you know, solved this minor misunderstanding on my part, Danica has been hooking us up left and right with outrageous deals for the Linux Action Show. And so, you know, I, I, I mean, I'm not saying you should take advantage of my close, I mean, our, I mean, our uh, close. Know, I'm, not saying I have a sneaky, I'm not saying I have a sneaky relationship no. on the side that nobody should really no. know about. And it's no, getting me no. secret hookups from GoDaddy.com. But if I were, and Matt was 
complicit in this. If this all was happening, we might have some outrageously good deals for you to use when you're over at GoDaddy.com. First of all, you can take 35% off any new order, anything you're getting, you know, mm-hmm. take 35% off the top. If you use the code GO35OFF3, mm-hmm. GO35OFF3 is 35%. But here's the, here's the real deal that I think Danica personally got for us. I'm interested in hearing this. And she... Usually she scores some really killer deals. I here. mean, she's she's on and off over the last few months. She's been she's been breaking into the GoDaddy headquarters. She steals a batch of these codes, and then we have them for a limited yeah. time, and then they get all used up, and then we, I have to call her up. I mean, somebody calls her up and convinces yeah. her. Somebody. Uh, right, <laughs> to go in and get some more. And that's uh, the code Linux295. If you use the code Linux295 when you check out, you get a dot .com for $2.00. And 95 cents. What's awesome about that is Linux 295 also works for domain transfers. So if you bring your oh. domain over to GoDaddy for their awesome management capabilities, mm-hmm. use Linux 295. You get the transfer for $2.95 and a year's worth of domain. Nice. Renew- yeah. They, they, you got to love that, right? Yeah, they give you a year. That's awesome. So thank you to GoDaddy.com yeah. and thank you to the secret somebody who's been hooking us up with fantastic deals over at GoDaddy. And thanks to all of you guys who, who support our sponsor Definitely. and keep the show on the air. Big All right, Matt. So All I right. thought we've been real serious lately with our picks. Yes, yes, you know, we have. We've been talking a bit about very, it. very, gra- very granular, very SSH focused tunnels. Sure. You know, real, mm. real serious stuff. So mm-hmm. it's time, Matt, to have a little, bit, little bit of fun with our app picks. I got two, two game picks this week for for the Android. Okay. First up for Android, and then I got one for Linux. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna just, uh, I'll tell you right up now. This is a guilty pleasure of mine. It's called Subway Surfers. It's mm-hmm. a free app, and they do kind of put a little bit of spam in your face. Sure. But the fun thing about it is, it's it sort of addresses the problem I have with touch interface games. Right, that it's the, the control of it and trying to yeah, manipulate awkward. your characters and it whatnot. It just doesn't work sure. right. Yeah. No. Uh, where, whereas with uh, subway servers, it's just you're just swiping. So basically, and, there's really no way to do it wrong. I mean, right, exactly. Yeah. It's pretty and straightforward. Here, I'll play a little, uh, I'll play cool. a little clip of it, and uh, while I'm also playing it, let's see, if I can, let's see if I can pull this off. There we go. Yeah, okay, you ready? Okay, here I go. Here we go, Matt. So the whole idea is you run and swipe, and you get coins. And it, it, the whole thing, it's like it's a reactionary. You want to react as fast as possible. Oh, yeah. Oh, that seems to go pretty easily. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, it's easy enough for the kids, too, which is nice, so we can play together. And it's just really simple. It's just... Uh, it's and, and the longer you play, the faster it gets, and there's more tricks and more jumps and more maneuvers. That helps. I think that yeah. definitely helps with the flow of the game. Oh, 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 oh. Yep, oh, oh. See, I'm not playing very good right now, Matt, but oh, no, not, that's not the right thing to do. <laughs> But it's a good game, and I've had a lot of fun with it. Uh, and I've played it on and off for a couple of weeks with my son Dylan, and he likes it too because uh, it's it's simple enough that since you're just swiping the screen sure. and you're just reacting to what's coming at you, it's it's pretty low. Well, and it teaches you uh, action reaction. It definitely does that too, uh, and it's it's quick. You can pick it up and you can suspend it later. It's nothing too serious, so it's a real low stress kind of game. Now it seems like it really does well on a tablet. I wonder how it would do on a phone. You know, as it works. As... Well, of course, my phone has a ginormous screen. But, yeah, I was gonna uh, say <laughs> nice. It works pretty good. I, I I found it worked pretty good on the right on. phone too. It's got an average of 4.7 ratings in the uh, pretty good Play Store, and it is free. They'll try to upsell you a few times, but you know, yeah. hey, why not, right? It's called uh, Subway Surfers, and they have a few different series out, or, or at least I think they're going to have a few different series out. So go grab it, totally free. Nice. Score. All right, let's talk about a, a, a kind of an interesting hmm. type of video game for the Linux desktop. It's called Dead Cyborg, and it is an episodic donation-based sci-fi adventure game. I was going through the screenshots of it, and it definitely looks... Uh, it, it caught my attention because it was not like anything I'd really seen before. It, you know, it's not. So this guy is doing um, uh, what he calls about two to three hours per episode of mm. gameplay. So he's releasing them as the kind of the money comes in. Uh, so Deadly Cyborg is a free-to-play donation-based sci-fi adventure game for Windows, Linux, and Mac. The story is about the meaning of life and death wow. in a rusty post-apocalyptic Metal and concrete world. Deep. Yeah, yeah. Very deep. And uh, see if we go over to the donate. See, he's got here on this page. You can see he totally funded uh, episode one. Oh, I see. Okay, that's what they were. Well, I was going through that. I was trying to kind of wrap my head yeah. around it. So ideally, you've completed episode one, and you're excited about that. You're waiting for episode two, but in order to make that happen, everybody has to come together and actually kick down right. some funds. And what's oh, interesting yeah. is he hasn't quite huh. reached um, uh, full funding for episode two. Sure. But he's already released it, and now he's working on episode three. And I so I downloaded That's decent of them. Yeah, yeah. Here I'll, I'll plug this in. I downloaded yeah. uh, episode one. Oh, okay. And so it's not, as far as I can tell, so much a shoot 'em up game as right. it is sort of a um, not missed, but almost that kind of genre of game where. There we go. So you can hear it now. I love the little intro screen. It's kind of wavy. So and jack. the world is really cool. Yep. So here it is. Um, very kind of run down. 
uh, sci-fi futuristic mm-hmm. look to it. And it's totally this, you know. And there's lots of little clues, so I can go over something. I investigate it, and it gives me a little, uh, little readout there at the bottom of my screen. Uh, oh, it says, uh, "Well, I'm." It says, "Well, I'm from the past. You might mm-hmm. experience memory problems and after effect of the hibernation. This is why I'm sending this message to you, right? So you get these little clues as you go around. <laughs> kind of reminds you of good old classic adventure yeah. games, right? Like, why am I in this hibernation room, and how do I get out, and and what clues are in here? And, well, it does, but it does so with some visual interest. It's not, yeah. you know, it's not too uh, mundane at all. And what I like about it is, uh, is the whole the whole idea Ooh. that uh, if I, I can kind of, I can play for a couple of hours, right? And then when the next episode comes out." You know, play that for a couple hours. I already know that two episodes are out. That's kind of why I'm mentioning it now because episode one shipped, and now we have sure. episode two. And he's already working on episode three, so it's it's an ongoing storyline, which is really cool too. It's really cool, and it's nice bite-sized pieces, so you're not becoming so overwhelmed. And there's lots of visual hints for the clues, mm-hmm. like the things that are shiny. I know I'm supposed to go up to. You see those little arrows on the screen that tell me where to go and stuff. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's subtle, but it's there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You got spider webs over here. Uh, I think this is this is very cool. Yeah. It's very well done, and I like the model that they came up with. I think that's a really creative way it not only ensures development because it does motivate people but uh they're getting something cool for it yeah so this is called uh dead cyborg and it's just an in- it's it's a one-man show just an independent guy who is uh oh hi there uh, hello. <laughs> who is uh you know just trying to work on his passion project and get a little funding for it so i say more power to him totally oh, of course now i have to hold on matt stand by it's talking to us how do you alt f4 okay there we go there we go, there we go. let's check it out dead cool. cyborg and uh i've only played uh, just a little bit of the first episode but i love the concept i love where he's going and you know yeah. he's he's already producing results i'm i'm actually really digging that i think they did a nice job so congrats to you there is uh there is a link in the show notes to mm-hmm. dead cyborg or you can just go over to deadcyborg.com all right matt so next weekend oh my goodness <laughs> Big show next Big weekend. Show. The Linux Action Show will be live at Linux Fest Northwest 2013, April 27th, and it's the 28th. We're going to be there the 27th, all day Saturday. Mm-hmm. Now, mm-hmm. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> we hope to be live streaming all day long. I'll tell you, it's been a little touch and go. Um, yeah. The uh, the guy that I work with to do some of our equipment, he rented out all of his gear for NAB, and not all of it's come back yet. So we're a little short-handed oh, in terms no. of, of of gear, but I think we'll be okay. Might cool. you know there might be some technical snafus, but we'll work all that out. Cool. We'll have a booth. We'll have internet connectivity. You can stop by and say hi to us. Yeah, you can actually meet us in real life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, see that we're not just holographic projections no. or cardboard. Well, well, ours are, well, ours are going to have some giveaways. Yeah. We're going to have some stickers. We're going to have some TechSnap 100 shirts yeah. to give away. The last, the very last of the TechSnap 100 batch collectors edition stuff. I mean, you're not going to yeah. be able to get this anywhere else. We'll have those at the booth. You can come mm-hmm. say hi with us, and maybe we'll run out and uh, grab uh, some lunch with you guys if uh, we get a little crowd so come check us out over at linux fest northwest and of course jupiter broadcasting which is very awesome is on here as one of the media sponsors in fact the number one on the list right there just saying just saying and they just posted the schedule too so you can go over there and uh, see what they got coming up Mm -hmm. uh, at the the different uh, events and things like that. very cool it's always a really great event every single year they have never let me down they've always got something cool to see something cool to participate ask you know get questions answered get your linux installed if you're needing help with stuff there's great people there yeah now i got one email i thought we'd read at the top of the show oh yeah which is very germane for this week's episode Mm -hmm. hola chris and matt i've been watching for several months and i love the show Mm -hmm. i love the hands heads up on various topics and i like the pick section which is why i'm reading this now because we've had some critiques of the pick section he says i also like the coverage of ubuntu Oh, dun, so they're dun, haters. Dun. Yeah. Now, whenever we do a lot of Ubuntu coverage on the Linux Action Show, actually, if we even just cover an Ubuntu story yeah. in the Linux Action Show. We use show, the word Ubuntu. We even yeah. make an uh sound. I mean, yeah. Yeah, it's Ubuntu, weird. Ubuntu, anything like that. There, there always is a barrage of criticism for even yeah. talking about it. So it's, it's nice shame. every now and then to get an email from somebody who says they don't mind. Uh, he also wanted to know if we wanted to explore our own cloud's capabilities more and talk about maybe using it as a Google replacement. I think that's going to come. We're just going to wait for it to bake yeah. a little more. Uh, he also says maybe uh, promote the idea of, check this out, hmm. cooking up some sort of Android ROM that kind of replaces Google services with own cloud services. So apps for files, Cal Dev, Card Dev for uh, um, it's not you know, a bad idea. yeah, and scheduling with the calendar, not the email interface and all that kind of stuff. Hmm. Um, okay, yeah, that's yeah. actually not a bad idea. Yeah, he also has a few suggestions for our new Plan B show, including uh, covering being a little more anonymous with Bitcoin and things like that. Which Interesting. Be so good stuff. Thanks, Great Sam. feedback. Yeah, thanks, Sam. Thanks very much. And uh, you can always get a hold of the show by going over to JupiterBroadcasting.com and mm-hmm. clicking that contact link, and then choosing Linux Action Show, or start a thread in our subreddit over at LinuxActionShow.reddit.com. We're always there. Absolutely. Always lurking. All right, Matt. Let's do the news. Hey, 
Hey, it's the news, and this episode is brought to you by... Everybody knows it's brought to you by Ting.com. That's right, Ting is mobile that makes sense. Go over to Ting.com. Go to last.ting.com. Don't fool around. I am a long-time Ting customer now. I can say that because I've been using it for two months. That's quite a while. Hey, that's a commitment. That's a Actually, commitment. no, you know, I love Ting so much that uh, I'm going to add my mom to Ting. Go over here to nice. tinglast.ting.com. Check out their dashboard. I have the video playing right now. It gives you an idea of why I like Ting. First of all, they have an Android app that's really easy to use. Mm-hmm. But the dashboard makes it super obvious where I'm at with my account. And here's why that's important to me. Going to Linux Fest this weekend. Yes. Next weekend, right? And I'm going to oh, bring yeah. I'm bringing my mobile computer with me. My Note 2. This is your connection to the world. My mobile workstation. And I'm going to be logging into my Ting account just to make sure I'm not going over. That makes sure Sure. I'm using the amount, not too much data. And you know, if I do use too much, it's not actually a big deal because Ting will just charge you for what you use. And Uh also, transversely, if I don't use as much as I thought I would, that's one of the great things about Ting. Get ready for this. They credit you for unused service. If you use less than you thought you would, Ting drops you down to level and hits you with the credit difference on your next bill. How you gotta crazy love that, that, right? I mean, remember how this is a cell phone company? This is cell. Wow. This is this is mobile that makes sense. This is how they do it. This is how they challenge the industry. And Ting is doing it right here, you guys. Also, they have that powerful account control panel. They have unlimited devices on one plan. So I'm gonna just toss my mom on there for one flat six dollar nice. a month fee. I love it, but really. Come on. We've been telling you about Ting for a little bit, so now it's time to actually do a little something mm-hmm. about it. When you go over to Ting, last.ting.com, I want you to take your cell phone bill with you and sit down at their savings calculator. Just fill in what you have on your current bill. So tell them who your provider is. Give them the, you know, the deets. Yeah. They're, not gonna, they're not tracking this stuff. They're just helping you calculate it and how much you use and be amazed at the savings difference. I think they kind of massage you into just the right plan to fit your needs. That's what I like. And, and it's super easy to uh, mix and match what you mm-hmm. want. If over the uh, plans that Ting has, you just go up there and you just say, you know, I want uh, 500 minutes, I want 100 text messages, and I want a gigabyte of data. Boom. Totally. $42 totally. a month plus surcharges. No hidden fees on your bill, just the taxes that they legally have to charge you. That's all it is. And of course, of course, because you've got other things to do than, than worry about uh, like getting support when you actually have a problem, yes. Ting makes customer service dead simple. Go over to Ting, check out what they've got. And if you've got any questions, give them a call. 1-855-TING-FTW. Anytime between 8 p.m. and 8, 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. Eastern, mm-hmm. you get directly connected with an actual person. That's right. No voicemails, yep. no computery thingies. People, people. I'm telling you, 855-TING-FTW. Mm-hmm. Go to last.ting.com to save $25 off a device, contract-free device, or $25 off your service. If you've got one of their devices you can bring with you, they've got a little bring bring your own device plan. I like that. Yeah. So I like that. Check it out. I'll be rocking my note, too. I'll be tweeting from Linux Fest. I'll be streaming. I, I'm hoping, like, if we go that to lunch, cool. I'm hoping to do a little live streaming nice. from the note, too, right? I love it. I love it. Totally. And the fact that it's all, uh, it's all on TikTok. I just I'm, yeah. I couldn't be happier. I'd like you to try it. Last.ting.com and thank you to Ting for sponsoring the Linux Auction Show. Big thank you. All right, Matt, we've got some good stories, Yeesh. and I think we should start with one that makes me warm in the heart. Yeah. Open source is eating the software world. <laughs> 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 is that okay? No, that's not all right. That's not, that was a little inappropriate. I'm sorry. It's actually true, though, and it's pretty obvious to anybody who works in the uh, consulting industry. I've watched this now for, I've watched this trend for 13, 14 years. Uh, But this was specifically a survey done by, I like the name, Mm. Black Duck Software. And, That's actually very cool. Yeah, I know, right? And uh, Northbridge Venture Partners today announced the results of the seventh annual Future of Open Source Survey, which found that open source software has matured to such an extent that it now influences everything from innovation to collaboration among competitors, and even hiring practices. With over 800 respondents, both vendors and non-vendor communities, mm-hmm. they, co- they combined all these results. Nice. And here's what they showed. And I thought... So I've noticed... Okay. Okay. Uh, what's been your perception? In so this? my perception has been it initially came in as a cost savings move. Sure. You know, and that's always been a lot I've heard. Uh, also, like, uh, and and that is not just from like a purchasing software, but that's from a hey, we're going to deploy a solution for you, right? And in order for us to save money, we're going to utilize a lot of open source mm-hmm. code. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, like I've I've seen a lot of people that use like back end conversion processors, like PDF converters for websites and image image stuff, and all everything that used right. to be proprietary software has over time been transitioning on the back end to open source. And that has always been primarily cost-driven. Now, what's interesting is this survey is showing it's kind of shifting from a cost-driven reason for using open source Mm -hmm. to an innovation reason. Oh, no, really? 
Yeah, that's in- uh, so that's interesting because I think there's still that perception out there that somehow open source is what you use when you can't money. afford yeah. or don't want to spend money on these things, which right. I, this is actually proving to be different. The other big thing, hmm. and this has always been beyond the cost, because when you're working at Enterprise, I, I always think it's short-sighted to look at the real upfront costs, sure. but people do. The thing that's always been a huge factor for me, and it was apparently a huge factor for the last two years in the survey, is vendor lock-in. Yeah. So when when you buy a when you buy a closed source software that your business relies on for some core function, maybe it's your online banking mm-hmm. component, which I've personally experienced. Maybe it's orders. It's it's some sort of component that your business flows through that is, de- is you're dependent on. And when it's proprietary, you essentially become married to that vendor, right. and in a way, part of your business becomes dependent on that vendor. And the vendor knows that, and oftentimes will adjust their uh, behavior accordingly. And it and associate huge support contracts. Exactly. And and on top of that, if they make any kind of big product changes or go a different direction, you're left in the lurch. That's right. And you often will see when you go into businesses, uh, you know, old machines running Windows 2000 or, or some legacy system that has been around forever – just because they don't make an update for the application that works on a new version of an operating system, so right. they've got to keep this box running. That's right? right. So that's vendor lock-in, and it is a huge problem in the enterprise. Uh, now, what was interesting, though, is freedom from lock-in, which used to be one of the number one reasons, dropped to the number two position, hmm. while quality of code and innovation became the number one reason. That's awesome on multiple levels. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that's a huge that's, that's a huge sign that the code's maturing. Um, and it's also a sign that people in the enterprise are more than just ancillary aware of this kind of mm-hmm. stuff. They're actually paying attention. They're, they're you know, they're, they're, wa- they're watching. Maybe they're listening to their IT department a little more. I think so. And I think just overall development is actually keeping pace to a point to where we're, uh, hello, hello, to where we're actually seeing, uh, seeing it outpace the proprietary space. And that's cool. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, it's been an interesting trend to watch personally. Mm-hmm. Something else has been interesting to watch. We've all been watching this recent one, yes. Ubuntu Touch. And a new version, I probably to coincide with the release of the desktop version, has been released for devices. And uh, you've got one of like uh, three or four devices they're officially releasing images for, mm-hmm. although it's showing up on a lot more devices. Right. Uh, it has now been updated. Here, I got it right here. I yep, updated yep, this yep. last night, Matt, and it is now based on thir- Ubuntu 1304. Nice. Um, probably the major difference is uh, more functional applications, like there's... Uh, oh, less placeholders. Sure. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Less placeholders. Mm-hmm. Uh, l- it also feels a little snappier. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just say it, it feels like it's uh, maybe... Um, I don't think it's using Mirror yet, but it feels like it's, I don't know, it just feels like it's a little more responsive, like it's tracking my finger a little bit better. Uh, they've got, they've added, uh, some of the some of the programs I've played with, they've added a calendar program now that's working. The camera app has gotten a little bit of a refinement. It actually oh, yeah. is pretty snappy. And look, it's actually, it's pr- actually pretty the good image looking. quality looks a little better too now. Well, everything seems more responsive, as you point out. Oh, uh, that is really actually, watch, watch. Wow, that's quite fast. It just slides right away. Yeah, the image. That's really, really good. Yeah, that is really cool. Wow. Uh, so there's that, and that's that's obviously good. The, uh, the overall, still not production ready. I no. mean, it's uh, it's it's probably not even close to being your daily driver yet. But it, hey. I would maybe call it a preview. Yeah, sure. They're working on it, man. Yeah. They're working on it, and it's really cool. It's it, they're continuing to update it, and I've. It's it's I found the process to update it from the old builds to the new builds mm-hmm. is simple as you plug in the USB cable, you run a couple of commands on the command line. Bob's your uncle. You've got it on your Nexus device. It's pretty straightforward. Whatever you might have. It's very straightforward, very easy to use, and I'm just playing with it still. Um, there's still a lot of power management issues. There's still a lot of placeholder apps. Sure. But Well, and I think they did a fair job of letting people know that this is not, as you pointed out, it's not production ready. This yeah. is simply something to play with to see the direction of where they're going to be going. I'm not sure if it's just my imagination either, but the browser seems a little better too. Very probably. Yeah. Um, and here's the check it out. Tell me what you think of this. Here is calendar, the uh, okay. calendar app. And it's a little, see, it's a little sluggish to load the calendar app. Sure. But well, it's not too bad though. No, it's, it's, it's not too it's bad. clean, right? It's, it's quite clean. It's actually. not amazing, but it, it kind of definitely has a Windows phone feel to it, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, I, I don't mean to use the, you know, four-letter word here, but yeah, I'm just saying it. It does like feel like that, and maybe that's what I honestly think. That's what they're going after. I think that's really the market they're going after. So there's the, the so there's the new event creation yeah, screen. I mean, it's not it's, bad. Yeah, it's 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 all you know, it's all coming along nicely. It's it's getting functional. So that's very cool to watch. And it's coming along pretty well. And I think the, they've got some contrast issues they're going to work with uh, over time, but it's not bad. I gotta say, mm. not convinced the gesture uh, based UI. Everything on here is gesture based. I still, even having used this now for a couple of months, get a little stumble, get a little lost sometimes. And one of the big criticisms of uh, the BlackBerry Q and X, the new, the newest release they've done, right. is the gestures are very unintuitive. 
and some of them remind me of the gestures in Ubuntu Touch. Research in Motion still around? Oh, oh, they're called, no, actually, they're called BlackBerry now. Oh, they're called BlackBerry. Oh, yeah, okay. I see. I, I, I honestly thought they went bankrupt like what five years ago. I don't. I'm somehow, I'm somehow kidding. they're not. Somehow. But no, I think the bigger point that you bring up is uh, that really that there's going to be a learning curve with this, and if mm. they're, and they're going to have to really examine which market they're trying to target with that, and whether or not that's going to. Well, and it's kind it's of like snap, it's kind know? of like coming out with a desktop UI. That doesn't have a uh, that doesn't have an application menu. Right. When the desktop now the, the the interface paradigm is sort of being established, and the only reason I say that, even though it's all kind of still early days in the sure. big picture, is you know uh, uh, millions of these devices are on the market. Google mm. announced something like they're activating 1.5 million new Android devices a day or something. Did you hear? Whoa! That? Did you Whoa. hear this? No, I did not. But that is I that would not be overly surprised. Did anybody in the chat room hear the? There was just a new activation number that was given out, and it's just absolutely insane. And well, and that that goes back to my point of who, yeah. what market are they going to target? See, here it know? is, right I here. Really, uh, I really believe that. I think they're probably going to be targeting non-smartphone folks, and if they are, they really need to rethink that UI because I don't see it working. I mean, so here we're talking Android activations: 1.5 million uh, Android devices are activated a day, not yeah. a quarter, not a month. Right. In 24 hours, 1.5 million <sighs> new devices come online or get reactivated. Now. And then you also got the, all these new Android people that are then the, investing into the Android ecosystem, such the as apps, the store, the apps, music place. So yeah. you're then. This is why I say the the you know who, whoever Ubuntu is going to be targeting. This matters because there's an investment in these app stores. And you can't and, ask them to just drop that. And and there's there's a UI paradigm that's been mm -hmm. established. Yes. And uh, it's got a huge. It's it's adoption is. I I I believe that number has now pushed Android uh, for a little while now to be a larger deployment than Windows. So yeah. Uh, oh, it is. <clears throat> I, I, I think. I think at this point, right? So then that means Ubuntu Touch is literally going up against an install base that is larger than the Windows install base. Yeah, because I mean, just overall, I think desktop laptop stuff uh, has shrank or at least kind of settled down or yeah. fizzled down yeah. a little bit. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow, wow. Well, um, mm. we'll see where it goes. And I, I'm not necessarily, and it's not. I'm not necessarily saying it's not going to work. Um, because oh, I think a lot I of, think it has an opportunity. Yeah. But they, they definitely need to really narrow down who their target market is, and they darn well better make sure that that is an interface that is going to work for that target market. And I don't see either things happening yet. So I don't know. Stay tuned to Stay find tuned. out. All right, something else that could be very interesting. Both Matt and I love ourselves some Netflix. Yeah. Netflix has announced that they plan to move to HTML5 video streaming from Silverlight. Mm-hmm. This is a really big deal, obviously, because it could open the door for Linux use. Now, I've got Netflix here on my uh, on my machine, yes, and uh, but it uses Wine and uh, yeah. to do Silverlight, and you know it's it takes some resources. But... You got to have a powerhouse machine for sure, and it's you know it doesn't work on every distro mm -hmm. and et cetera, et cetera. So right. here's the thing: the solution would be HTML5 based, but it's going to depend on a still relatively young technology, and we're talking really young technology that essentially wraps HTML5 video in DRM. Right. Netflix has been collaborating on a W3C standard that we're working together with Google and Microsoft dubbed HTML5 Premium Video Extensions. They include the extension, uh, the included extension will allow the company to handle delivery of streams via JavaScript and will allow DRM encryption. Okay. This extension uh, will make will allow Netflix to make sure that any communication between its JavaScript code and its servers remains secure. It's an interesting idea. I mean, for those that are not familiar with it, the little set top boxes like Roku and things of that sort. Probably, you know, a lot of these things are actually using. Uh, I, th I believe it's actually hardware uh, DRM chips yeah. themselves. So yeah. that's more of a hardware approach. Where this would be taking a software approach and it's mm -hmm. doing so without the dependency of Flash or Silverlight. Yeah, that's going to be interesting to see how that works and whether or not. Yeah, I don't know. I'm skeptical. I'm skeptical. The uh, the uh, Verge article goes to say that uh, the Chrome OS version of Netflix uses the first two extensions in the suite already, mm -hmm. but the third hasn't been built into Chrome at the moment. So Netflix is using its own plugin instead on Chrome OS. We've wondered how they pulled this oh, off okay. on Chrome OS before. Right. And I've linked in the show notes uh, to uh, to the W3C page on encry the encrypted media extension. If you guys are curious, um, Matt, is this hmm. is this ruining the open web dream of HTML5 video? And I, I see it as more of a practical thing. Um, for someone such as myself, I don't watch Netflix on a computer, so it's I, I'm really not too concerned about it. But for someone that is maybe concerned about the direction of where all this is going to be headed, are we letting something out of the gate that's going to create new problems? Is this, uh, you know, how big a deal is this truly? That remains to be seen. I, I really think it remains to be seen. I think at the end of the day, you're going to have a camp that is fine with it because they get to watch Netflix. And then I think you're going to have the folks that are a little more purist in nature and are going to have a fit. 
So yeah, I think you know the compromise has already been made when uh, when so. when the HTML5 spec didn't specifically call for an open standard codec for yes. the you know Theora or WebM when we when they capitulated and said all right, you could kind of use anything you want as long as the browser supports sure. it. Well, that opened the door for a proprietary license mm-hmm. technology right there from the get-go. Absolutely. And let's let's not fool ourselves. The browsers include thousands of different support for things that are yeah. proprietary. Uh, GIFs. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like, <laughs> take your pick. Yeah. Right? Uh, so am I happy DRM's uh, in there? No. No. I, I just don't see it working any other way. Uh, and uh, I, I, we've talked about in previous episodes way back, um, one of the big problems with HTML5 video versus Flash is there isn't a way to sort of restrict content. And while I don't like that, I mean, we use HTML5 I, exactly. video now. Uh, and we do not restrict content. No. Content providers do require yeah. that. And mm-hmm. As long here's the here's the here's the real here's the real story. I don't mean to sound like a jackass, but as long as you guys keep watching them instead of independent content like Jupiter Broadcasting, this is how it's going to be. You are the ones that are setting this. Not as long as you let them do it, they're going to continue right. to do it. It's only your fault. It's not it's not Netflix's fault. It's not Google's fault. It's not even Microsoft's fault. It's your fault because you're the ones that are paying these people to do this to you. Now, I do it too, so it's not all just you. It's me too. I'm, I have a Netflix subscription, Same but here. it's the reality. And if you don't like it, then you got to go Richard Stallman on the situation and completely avoid all things that use this and don't support them well, with your dollars. I, I would also go so far as to say I don't think – I really genuinely believe this. I don't think Netflix cares. I think it's the content providers that are providing content to Netflix yeah. and other services right. like that that basically pull the puppet strings. Well, I don't think Netflix <clears throat> gives a rip. So I think saying it's Netflix is – issue i think they pretty much like look we want to offer this content we want to do it this way we got to abide by our puppet masters and so, i like what you know. who me says in the chat room he says come on chris you know game of thrones is nice and you know it. now i've actually never seen game of thrones but i agree like there's a certain point where you just come right. become ra- rational and practical about it and say it is worth for my enjoyment to relax it is worth this compromise and absolutely. this is a compromise i'm willing to make just like i'm willing to part with the eight dollars a month for my netflix <laughs> right. subscription. absolutely right yeah. i mean that's eight dollars i could buy a lunch with well, that and if this actually will p- help to bring new content such as maybe we're going to start seeing like big bang theory or something like that actually appearing that would be cool well you know? okay so that's actually a huge point netflix is rolling out uh this this new original content like like uh like house of cards mm-hmm. uh like uh, and they're bringing, development. And bringing back Arrested Development, they're actually re, re, and also and not just Netflix, but also like Amazon is doing some really killer, yeah, uh, independent. But that's stuff, probably also going to be know. delivered with DRM. Oh, it, I'm sure it already is in Flash. So I imagine it will be with uh, you know but HTML5. Is this? I think is this? I I think I think the answer to this question is yes. But the question is: Is sure. this a price that we're willing to pay to maybe break up the entertainment monopoly that the that the that the industry has? Like, if if we have to sort of rob from peter to pay paul but eventually paul is able to destroy the entertainment media m- monopoly maybe it's worth doing that i think so i, I think at, at every level you're going to have uh, basically a pyramid of power you know that's kind of what we have with the major networks and if that begins to settle down a little bit new pyramids of power start growing with amazon netflix hulu yeah. things like that right um while it's not awesome at least we had some participation and control of perhaps making it more accessible, yeah, making it, it better at some level. Absolutely, and at least so. it's, uh, you know, I mean, it's it's at least more on our terms in a sense. Does that make right. sense? Like I, it's Well, and it, the thing, at the end of the day, when you're a creator and not a taker, I hate to use that phrase, but it's accurate. In this particular case, people that consumer. create content or consumer, the people that want to create content – they're going to distribute it in a way they see fit. We may not like that, and if we feel strongly enough about it, we won't participate in that yeah. content. But if we want it badly enough, this is the way they're distributing it. So right. we have a decision to make. And you know, I think you it know. should be. I think we should be clear at this point. There's actually been no confirmation that this stuff they're working on will work on links. I don't. Prob- see- oh, yeah, I could definitely see some user agency stuff yeah, going maybe, on. Yeah, maybe right. But it seems like if it's JavaScript, it should. well, yeah. But I mean, I've seen websites try this stuff though. You know, yeah. it happens. Yeah. I can totally see that, especially if Microsoft's got their fingers in it. Well, let's talk about so. something fun. Let's <laughs> let's let's move on to something that's that's because that, yeah. that stuff we don't know where that's nah. going. It's a bit of a downer. Nah. Uh, the Raspberry Pi. I think we're gonna. Ooh, yeah. I think next month, once we get through Linux Fest Northwest, we'll do a Q5 sys sent in his Raspberry Pi yes. for us to play with, and I think we're gonna have some fun Raspberry Pi experiments. We got. We better get it out of our system yep. soon because it looks like a new device is coming on the market. It could be pretty sweet. Uh-huh. The power of an Arduino with the flexibility of a Raspberry Pi combined in mm. one ninety nine dollar machine that can run both Android and Linux. Oh, I like that. 
check it out. Here's a little board here. It's got it's got the HDMI. It's got the mm. Ethernet and some mm-hmm. USB. And uh, it's up on Kickstarter right now. It's got nice. a free scale processor in there. Um, here, here's the Kickstarter. The Kickstarter is doing really well. Check this out. Uh, oh, they can... wanted 27k. They got 240k with 40 day, 48 days still to go. Whoa! 1600 backers. Whoa! Um, People want this bad. Yeah. Now <laughs> you gotta, you gotta, you gotta have to indulge me. I want to play their Kickstarter yeah, video yeah. here for a second. And then I have a little Kickstarter advice for you guys. Now, Matt, you won't be able to hear this, but... Sure, sure. sure. I have to just do it. I'm a professor in the electrical and computer engineering department at Carnegie Mellon. All right, so he's a professor at Carnegie Mellon. His audio is horrible, you guys. If you do a Kickstarter video or an Indiegogo video, don't use the microphone on the camera. What you could do is just get... Get like a little record, portable recorder device off of Amazon or something, mm-hmm. and put it. You can put it directly in front of him on the table, yeah. and then record that audio, and then sync it up later. Here, Matt, I'll play a little bit so you can hear yeah. how bad it is. Oh yeah, yeah, isn't that awful? Yeah, and, I'm, and I've got a little Olympus recorder. It's they're not yeah. expensive, and they, it's just USB. Just pop it in, and Obviously, syncing the audio is easy. Didn't hurt the funding. No. I, I just, as, as any of you Linux Action Show viewers out there, if you're going to do an open source Kickstarter project yeah. or something like that, yeah, talk to us first maybe about the audio. Now, I am, I think this thing is so cool because it's, it gives you, first of all, the option to run Android or Linux is going to give mm-hmm. it a ton of more use cases. Definitely. Scenarios. I think that's going to be a lot of embedded potential there. It's 4.33 by 3.55 inches, nice. and it uses, I guess, the power, can, it uses, um, uh, let me. I have this backwards. Four Raspberry Pis Whoa. use the power of one of these. Like it's got. Wow. I guess I don't know that. I don't know how much right. power a Raspberry. Oh, I didn't works, think it was very much, yeah, but, but yeah, that's interesting to know. Uh, just a quick spec overview. It's going to have uh, OpenGL support. It'll have one gigabyte of RAM. It'll have uh, Wi-Fi. It'll have HDMI. Nice. It'll have USB. It'll have SATA. On I, the, I lo- the Wi-Fi being built in is kind of a big deal. And on, yeah. they're going to have a quad-core version that has status. You could Ooh. actually hook up. A, now, for storage, that's oh, I think that's, that's a big yeah, deal. Yeah, between that and the Wi-Fi, it's like, hey. And you ready for this? Yes. A little. Now, it doesn't come with it. But on the board, it's going to have a little connector for a camera. Oh, yeah. Right? So you can make a little, like, little surveillance machine oh, with see a that, hard drive. This is that. actually what I've been wanting because I've been yeah. wanting to DIY a little yeah. home surveillance stuff. I want uh, my pits. Okay, chat room points out. Shane, Shane's in the chat room. He's got a whole bunch of Raspberry Pis that he does sure. a bunch of fun stuff with. Yeah, he yeah. points out that for the price of this thing, you could buy four Pis. Yep, eh, yep. That's a good point. Yep, that's yep. a good point. I'm telling you, though, the way of the future is you get one of these things, and then you hook up one of those jalapeno uh, uh, Bitcoin miners from Butterfly Labs, and yep. then you, you just have yourself this thing mining Bitcoins. It's like a money print factory for you. <laughs> I couldn't help it. The I love that, there. right? Yeah, I yeah, help totally. It. I'm sorry. You know, uh, I just want to give it a quick plug. If you go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com, we just launched a brand new show. It's in its second episode, so it's a great time to jump in. That's our Plan B show all about Bitcoin. Yes. Looking at it from the enthusiast perspective, looking at it from a critical perspective. Mm-hmm. I say it's the practical person's Bitcoin show. You're going to come away learning stuff. I Every time I actually take the time to listen to this, I'm actually discovering something new about it that I didn't understand because I don't participate myself. So this is – it's an education, and it's a free education, right? I mean you can get in here and check it out. It's cool. Hey guys, I've already, I got quite a debate going in the chat room about the Butterfly Labs. I just make one comment about Bitcoin. We got a whole debate going. <laughs> Got a whole there's some passion there. You, you can see why I made a show. Oh man! Wherever there's awesome. uh, wherever there's smoke, Matt, there's a burning, burning fire. Fire! All right. Uh, let me see. Any other news? Mm. Oh, Do-do-do. you know what? I got something. I'm gonna stow. I got. I yeah. got uh, one more thing. I might stuff in the uh, feedback segment before we get out of the news. There was one set of benchmarks that came out recently. Okay. And I thought this was super cool. And uh, because we've talked a lot about ZFS, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. however. Mm-hmm. This is according to Phronix. They did an in-depth ZFS on Linux comparison using the new out-of-tree kernel module, the brand new one we just talked about recently, yeah. and compared to get to, compared the performance of ZFS against Extended 4, ButterFS, wow. okay. and XFS. Guess what? Who won? Who won? Extended 4 won by a pretty good margin. No kidding. <laughs> yeah, in, in terms of, in terms of wow. read-write performance, uh, EX24 was actually, oh in, in some cases, wow, in some cases, yeah. way ahead. Wow. That's incredible. Uh, here's the thing. Hmm. Here's the thing. This is kind of like comparing. Um, maybe this is a bad analogy, possibly, but it's kind of like comparing a fighter jet against a seven forty seven. True. Like ZFS is like uh, uh, it, it is so much more than just a file system. It is this. It is it is like this isn't the, an entire set of goals. I mean, basically. Well, I just don't think this is the kind of file system you run on a performance 
critical hard drive array. It's 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 the file system you run on an array where the data on that array is more valuable than anything else you own. So these file systems are very purpose driven, very and very redundant. With okay. A lot of with a lot of ch error checking, um, a lot of capabilities that aren't existent in extended for that would probably add overhead. Mm -hmm. And then you have it on a non-native operating system. Right. Right. That's that's a, okay. I I can definitely see your point there. But, you know, uh, it's still interesting. Ben to, uh, in the chat room says maybe it's more like an F-22 versus a B-2. You know, that's a, <laughs> that's a very good analogy, yeah. actually. Yeah. Uh, but I, I I wanted to put this in there just because it kind of continues the conversation and the dialogue we've been having about ZFS yeah. on Linux. It's been a huge point of interest for our audience, and I think it's been interesting to watch. You definitely use the file systems to work and best for what you well, need. yeah, right? That's really what it comes down to. We won't be judgy. Yeah. No judgy here. Yeah. No all judgy. right, Matt. Well, that's all the news for this week. Let's go review Ubuntu 13.04. Ladies and gentlemen, I have to tell you, I have to come clean. I have been worrying about this review. This review has been on my mind yeah. for a couple of weeks now. I've been stressing about it. It's hard. It's a hard review to do this well, it's And it's hard to make compelling differences where there may the differences may be more minor. Yeah. Yeah, and that's an interesting problem. But before we get to that, I yes. want to thank this week's segment sponsor, System76. Yeah. Now, listen. System76 makes the best machines to run Linux out of the box. How do I know that, Matt? How do I know that? How do you know How this? Could I possibly, How could you possibly know this? Because I've owned System76 machines for years and years and years. So has Matt, both of us. Yes. And they've always been awesome. Now, I've owned desktops. Sure. I've owned laptops. Mm -hmm. Sure. I've owned more desktop and laptops than is responsible for a grown adult to actually have owned. <laughs> and let me tell you, out of all of them, I have never had a better laptop than my Bonobo Extreme from System76. Awesome. I love this laptop. Sweet, sweet rig. So powerful. Powerful, never misses a beat, completely compatible, trouble-free. Yeah. The experience that I want from my system is I w if I want to play a video game, I want to sit down and just play. If I want to sure. just do an update, I don't want to worry about compatibility issues down the road. I don't want any kind of stressors like that because my machine is a tool 90% of the time. Sure, I love to play around and try stuff out, but most of the time I need to get work done. That's why I use a System76. It is the best Linux experience on a computer. Well, this thing has like what dedicated graphics, its own subwoofer. I mean, you know. I mean, sure. If you want, if you want to run <laughs> like, Linux on your windmill, I can't recommend System Seventy Six. No. I can't do that. That's a windmill thing. Yeah. yeah. No. And there's probably companies that make fine windmills. Sure. However, if you want to use Linux on a computer, go over to System Seventy Six dot com. Get yourself something nice and tell them the Linux Action Show sent you. Yes. All right. So Ubuntu thirteen oh four. I can sum it up. I can. I could actually sum up the entire review with one word. Speed faster. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, it is a lot faster. It's noticeably faster. Um, I, I don't know if I can properly demo how much faster it is. I, I've looked at um, after running it. I actually found a video that did some side by side stuff, and it, it's definitely noticeable. Yeah. I would say it's more in the mil millis uh, with loading and such. I'd say probably in the seconds to milliseconds. But there's 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 small little things that have made it feel, feel much much faster. I'm I like I'm just I'm playing with the launcher here. Sure, the launcher is, is it's so fast now that I've I've just removed GNOME Do from my system. I have Synapse installed. I don't run it. Now that's a a very compelling thing to where you've actually got you know yeah. got the launcher set up to where the speed is so impressive that yeah. another launcher is no longer deemed necessary. They're doing something right. And the thing about this is this has been a point of contention um, on the every review of Ubuntu since they've switched to Unity. Every review I've come on this show and I have said it is not fast enough. Right. You need to make the dash faster. They have done it. They have finally They've done a nice job. It's there in thirteen oh four. Overall, it's it's the the whole Unity interface. Everything feels like it's been slimmed down. And I, I gotta wonder if that's because of the optimizations for mobile. Probably, I'd say that's a big part of it. One one thing I would also point out is they've also made a lot of changes with. Uh, well, actually, little little things you might not notice. A Bluetooth uh, interface, for instance, um, compared nice. to you know, it actually it's more tightly integrated. Yeah, I want to show that. Yeah, Here, I, show I that have off. a I have Bluetooth. Uh, oh, I don't have it turned on. So if I turn on Bluetooth, which I I have here on my keyboard the little uh, bluetooth icon there shows go. up there in the tray yep and then uh you just have these and they're all, they're very and, touchy and no longer do you have to go into settings to make yeah. these changes you can do it right there from the menu so that's very tight. nice I toggle like switches they yes. work they work both with the mouse and with the mm -hmm. uh and with the with the key with the touch right uh, gnome has done a lot of these sliders that i've been critical in the past and 
I actually, you know what? I think I'm changing my tune on it just because it it's it's functional. Well, it's it saves nice. mouse clicks, or in this case, button pushes. You know, for sure. Yeah. Um, you know, there's definitely some graphical differences, and I think overall the biggest differences that I saw were mostly visual. Outside of speed, I'd say visual differences, very subtle visual mm-hmm. differences. Um, there's lots some, of tweaks in the menu bar. Yeah, and, uh, cloud services uh, was another one. I think they've actually got more integration and more control over like what's going on with Facebook. There was some tighter control there. Lots of account stuff there. Yeah. You can get more granular on your account controls. They've re sure. they've Rethemed Nautilus. Yes. Um, for better or for worse, depending on what you feel. I think it's pretty good. I really, it's, it's I clean, get it's minimal. It. They've yeah. moved a lot of stuff under this gear menu, so there's not a, there's not, a, right. there's not like the big menu bar. Here's, check out this though. Let's say you have a huge directory, like I have my downloads folder, yeah. just mm. packed full of stuff. Sure. sure. And I want to find, uh, maybe I downloaded a picture of Danica, right? Yeah, absolutely. So if I, now, if I just start, if I just start typing in place and type Danica, Look how fast that is. Oh, that's that's nice. Yeah, it, it, okay. it, it does in directory search very, 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 very and fast. And you can go all files and, or that directory. Yeah. And then there's all my pictures of Danica that I have on my hard drive. Oh, wow. And, you know, I can go through them very quickly and, mm. and uh, just, you know, review them, for sure. example. And then sort them and organize them like I do frequently. So I find Nautilus, and also the, the sidebar look is very clean. It's, it's actually more attractive than it has been in, in the past. And when things mount, like let's say you've got uh, some external storage on your Android device, for instance, you know that mounts up real nice. And it actually actually will, a lot of times, if it's a Nexus, it will even say it's a Nexus device, which I don't Oh, think. yeah, that's awesome. So let's try it. Oh, yeah. I didn't bring a USB cord. But yeah, so now you just, it's got MTP baked yeah. in, so you just plug in the uh, Android device, and it, it just pops up Nautilus right there. And, and, it, and it's actually, files. instead of saying some you know mounted device, it's actually giving you the name of the device and it looks more natural yeah. and fluid and tightly yeah. integrated. It's very very tidy. I was very happy with that. They've uh, they've done a lot of they've done a, they've done, done a lot of memory improvements. So they for have. example, a light DM which used to take about 30 megabytes of RAM now takes less than a meg of RAM. So a lot of little uh, shaving off uh, things there. OMG Ubuntu has done a fantastic job of they keeping did. people up to date with what's going on. Uh, not only has there been s- small things like new animations, but they've gone through and they've covered a lot of the uh, lens improvements. Yeah, we didn't get to see the smart scopes yes. in, in this. Now, that was, unfortunately, smart scopes, they just didn't feel like they were ready to ship it right. with Ubuntu. The nice thing about smart scopes is this would have addressed a lot of the privacy issues that people have with the current implementation of the product search right. in the Dash. Um, <clears throat> they have a much more intelligent, much... Uh, also much more functional uh, uh, smart scope system that just wasn't ready. Well, and I think that by holding off that it allows them to make sure that they're not releasing beta code into a made-for-public product, which I'm perfectly okay yeah. with. I have and no problem with them taking their time with I'm that. sure there'll be a PPA coming sure. to Sure, oh, absolutely. Soon. So as far as compatibility goes, uh, Steam is working out of the box on Ubuntu 30 that before. Matters. I haven't had a single game give me issue. I should back up, actually. I need to zoom out. I have hmm. been running Ubuntu 13.04 since... The week or two after we talked about KDE 410. Oh, really? So yeah. it's has that been since January or That's March? Pretty, yeah, and I've been running it for a couple of weeks. I you know both natively and I also tested it in a VM, which I will say in a virtual box VM for some reason. And I there's a few possibilities there. Not so much in a in a VM, but great. runs great natively though. So so this this is this is without question been the most stable development I've ever followed. Maybe yes. because they're doing a little less and they're also doing this test driven development where they're they're pushing mm-hmm. out code every single day and it's running through automated testing processes. But for for almost I think almost since January, yeah. I have every day okay. been running 1304 in production, mm-hmm. installing updates as they come down and 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 have had no problem. No breakage, I, I have, no hassles. Yeah. I have XFCE installed. I have KDE 410 installed. I have Unity installed. Right. I have a bunch of customized stuff installed, tons of PPA repos. None of it is broken. None of it has caused me an issue. I have not had a single day where I sat down on my client, opened up the lid of my laptop, and had one problem. That's nice to see. Not a single problem. I have, I have, you know, in the past been burned by using betas in production. <laughs> right. Oh, right. We all have. Yeah, and I've, yeah. I've had it right here happen on the show. I've had a meltdown. Sure. Not... Not an issue at all. This has been, this has been one of the best development releases that I've ever used. I would go so far to say this is the best Ubuntu I have ever used, and I will go one first step further than that. <laughs> this is one of the best desktop operating systems I have ever used. And I mean that. It is It is refined. It is fast. It is stable. There is a fantastic software selection. Mm. I know that if I buy my $40 video game, I can open up Steam and it will play on here. <laughs> that matters. All these things are fantastic. And yet, I find myself completely bored by it. 
I think that's the I think that's the 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 uh, kind of the twist point on it that you have found that it's so stable, it's so usable for what you're needing that it just kind of okay. Where's where's the excitement? Where's right? the fun? Right. Yeah, and so right. that is a huge feature on its own. But I think for us and our audience, it's it's a little boring. And yeah. it, what it what it what it shows me is is that. While there is obviously a dedicated core team of real pros who are working on 1304 at Canonical, mm-hmm. it, it is just not their focus anymore. They are just not pushing the envelope forward in some respects. Right. Now, yeah, you know what? Dash is great, and it looks super slick. But you know what doesn't look super slick? The exact other side of the screen where I have these menus that look like they're from 1998. Actually, the Bluetooth menu is okay. But everything else, like the shutdown menu, all this stuff, looks super crappy and old. Now, I will say they could have. Sh- well, the shutdown does have the nice pop-up when you actually go to shutdown. Yeah. It does. You know, it has oh, yeah. Some... They've redone the, uh, the, yeah. the shutdown screen. So that, that's, that's nice. nice. Yeah. But I, I'd say my biggest complaint, honestly, is, as you said, there's not a lot of uh, aggressive development in that space as far as sex and things up a little bit. My, my bigger things are uh, sound still stinks. Um, you know the pulse audio control, the volume control yeah, module that still. they provide you is is very limited. If you're yeah. using any type of a voice over IP or whatever, you really do need to look at another control uh, applet for that. And also calendar, um, I want some uh, a little more pizzazz there. Yeah, uh, I want yeah. a little more. I hate to say it, a little more KDE pizzazz there. See, this is this is <laughs> where just, you know. I'm kind of at. Is I look at some of the refinements, the continual refinements that Gnome are making, the continual refinements yes. that KDE are making. They're making the whole UI move forward. Whereas it feels like certain areas of Ubuntu are moving forward. Take take a look here. Yeah. Here's an example of a distribution who we don't really talk a lot about, but I really feel like is pushing the design trend forward in a way that Canonical could be taking inspiration sure. from. And that's Elementary OS. Oh, yeah. Elementary totally. OS is is very, very beautiful. It's based on Ubuntu, but they're doing things like you talk about. They're addressing weaknesses mm-hmm. on the desktop. Like, they're they're baking in their own calendar application. Nice. That's because, what I want. Yeah. Called Maya, because they recognize that this is a bit of a weak spot if you don't use Evolution or Right, or and Lightning. I don't. Yeah, and I totally don't. See, that, that actually appeals <clears throat> to me. And the fact that they're willing to just try things a little different, even use, utilizing existing technologies and, and blending them in and baking them up a little bit. It's kind of yeah. nice. So, uh, yeah, the chat room saying, oh, Elementary OS is, a, is an OS X clone. I don't mm. know if I, I – I haven't used enough to say that for sure. I've used it lightly. Uh, I, I think I think a lot, of, a lot of inspiration behind Canonical comes from a company that is a fruit company that has <laughs> been well-known for yep. their singular focus. Yes. And – I think there's been some inspiration drawn for the Ubuntu desktop, but the good parts. Sure. Unity sure. is just enough out of my way with just enough features that I feel like I'm not using a quote-unquote lightweight desktop, but I'm using a desktop that's very trouble-free, very low maintenance, True. but yet, unlike XFCE, where I kind of feel like I have a leg back in the 90s when I'm using right. XFCE. Oh, yeah. No, there's no there's no denying that. Yeah. But here, under in Ubuntu... I, it's it's still very fast. It's yeah. out of my way, but yet it's integrated with online services. It, it it has online search. It has a lot of new features at the same time. So I I don't Which feel like cool. I'm giving up the advances of modern technology right. just to use a desktop that stays exactly. out of my way. Right. Whereas with KDE, I sometimes feel like, man, I am using the most technically advanced desktop yeah. in the world. But boy, do I sure know about it all the time. <laughs> it's very in your face. Yeah. KDE is something where I would yeah. never park a new user in front of it ever, but I would absolutely recommend the heck out of it for someone that's bored with their desktop. Only. Wants to try something fun. Uh, yeah, that, that's that's my. It's like for me, it was just like I was so bored with other desktops. It's just I could scream, and I used to hate KD, but I tried it because it did. It, it added a little flavor. I, uh, I almost feel like know. Ubuntu is reaching the point where it's not even almost fair to compare it to other distributions, just in the sense of. So much just assumes that you'll have Ubuntu. Every, every yeah. major piece of software that comes out, Netflix, you know, uh, PPAs, boom, out there for Ubuntu right away. Mm-hmm. The first, the first place you're able to run Netflix on Linux is on Ubuntu. Bam, you know, all this stuff comes there it's for true. Steam. Bam, and so there's so much, com- so many compelling reasons to use Ubuntu that I remain here. And they've yeah. continued to refine it. They make it faster. They make it. Sure. They make all these kinds of fantastic things to it that you know are great, but. They leave me bored. Well, and another gripe that I have is the software center. Um, first of all, they for those that probably still don't realize this, they did not come up with the software center. They actually hired developers from Linspire before it went defunct, and that worked on the uh, CNR project and actually brought them into the company to then develop the software oh, man. center. So anyway, that being said, oh, let's I, talk I, about this. no the software center. It's just boring. It's it's, it's awful. I'm yeah. sure there's it's people that work really, very hard to get good apps in there. But it's it's like literally you can – and a lot of people don't realize this. You can use uh, app URL and go to the website for that exact same software store and, and install without all the 
the extra weight. Yeah, it is better on the web. So it's kind of like, okay, yeah. so what what now? I mean, what, no, it, the software center, yeah. not only, so here I am. Um, what was I trying to get? The other day, I was in here earlier for this a week. App, yeah. I was There was a new app they had in the store, and I'm like, you know what? I'm going to buy that. Oh, yeah. God, and, buying things is terrible. Oh, my gosh. I couldn't buy it. I had money in hand, <laughs> ready to buy the game, yep. and I couldn't do it. There was um, a well, problem f- with like a PayPal window pop-up well, or something. The, the fulfillment is just a mess. And, and the fact that like every other time I have to enter in my freaking shipping address to yeah. download an app. The Software Center is an embarrassment. It is. It is. It was okay when it came out years ago. The fact that they're still shipping it in 2013 like this, like sometimes you go in there and thumbnails just don't load for applications. Right. Sometimes they do. Sometimes they don't. Whereas if you go to that same page, literally on the in your browser, it doesn't have that problem. So it's literally the rendering happening yeah. in the software center itself. And the results speak for themselves. I mean, we've seen reports on what the software sales are. That's we've covered horrible. it on uh, Co- uh, Coder Radio several times. There's a reason why these software sales are bad. Well, the barrier to entry is, I mean, you getting your app in there is one thing. That's that's a whole other argument. But just once you get it in there, the, to the amount of crap you got to go through after you click the buy button is ridiculous. And I hate to say it again, but going back to, uh, you know, Linspire 5.0, for instance, with CNR, when you have a credit card all set up with them and you click the button to purchase something, it literally one prompt says, hey, you're about yeah. to buy something. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Click, done, bam, it's like finished. Yeah, it's aisles to where you can gra- grab all your software and easily drop them in, which yeah. technically this does have in the software center, but not nearly as fluid. You know, not you nearly just, as fluid. They, they Ubuntu, Ubuntu had, I believe, had, they had a software center before the Mac did. They had a software center they, you know, oh, yeah, they way did. early on. They had it very early on. Uh, but now they've been lapped. Um, now, I, yeah. Cheeseburger in the chat room tells me that, uh, that the, their feature for 14... Oh, for one of the next releases is re- improving the software center. I don't doubt that. And that would be cool. And and the and the idea is, I mean, in any distribution, I want a a, a source of discovery. That's all I really want the software yeah, center that's for. That's exactly it. Is you know? finding new app. Hey, you yeah. know what? I'm in the mood for a new desktop app. Sure. What do I want? And you know, this is this used to be a place to go. Uh, and the recommendations that, that it presents are great. Uh, that's cool. Um, you know, that's that it's an option that's turned off by default, which I appreciate, and that's and that's awesome. I, I think that's good. But it definitely seems like we're getting such a push with uh, very gaming sense. Centric, which is uh, kind of stereoty- kind of stereotyping. I think I think they need to start branching out to other things. Uh, the p- purchasing s- solution is just oh, I- I'm trying to find nice it's words. No, but it's, it's really There's... painful. Now, what do you I, think, Matt? This is here we are, 1304. Uh, obviously, behind the scenes right now, Canonical is working yeah. on redoing the display server. Canonical is working on rewriting Unity. Right. Uh, right, right. C- you know all of this stuff. Mm-hmm. Is this the last Ubuntu release for desktop enthusiasts for a while until the next LTS? Are they going to be just reworking the plumbing? I think so. They're, they're, I don't see any new, f- real new functionality. I do see some smoothing on a few things. Like yeah. you mentioned, there'll probably be some smoothing on Software Center. There'll probably be some smoothing out on other behind-the-scenes stuff. Uh, some graphical changes. Like, they, you know, like I love it when they make a big deal about, oh, look, the, the Software Center icon has changed. Who cares? Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, but I don't... Yeah. So what? Yeah. Um, you know, the, what the, you, I think what you said, elementary OS, that's the kind of stuff I care about. Yeah. A, a great calendar, uh, just some real deep functionality for me. Try, you know, tweaking things up a little bit. Hey, yeah. let's try this. Let's try that. Yeah. So yeah. Here's, here's the online accounts thing. Now, the reason why this online accounts thing is a bit interesting is the big – one of the, the – one of the original big split ups, not sure. V, but one of the big original split ups between Canonical and the GNOME project was this online accounts system. Ah, uh, yes, yes. And I, I, I mean, I think the verdict is in. This is oh, far and beyond superior to anything the GNOME project has done. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, oh, and you know what? We forgot to cover that uh, desktop collaboration story in the news, but I think, oh, yeah. you know, uh, hopefully this is going to get rectified. And now I see some definite collaboration stuff. Uh, you know, I see that being expanded upon, although they're already from the log, you know, from login, you can actually remote into a desktop and that sort of yeah. stuff. There's a lot of great things they're doing, and I think yep. that's cool. Yep. So I'm not harshing on Ubuntu. But I am bored with it, mm-hmm. and that, I, you know, and I don't know another way to put that. It's I would just, say it's like this: you know. uh, if you're, if you, if you, if you like Ubuntu, thirteen oh four seems like a slam dunk. Because actually, our recommendation sure. was possibly pass over twelve ten. Yeah, our, was I takeaway. really wasn't. I yeah, and on one machine, I never bothered. So, so if you're a twelve oh four user, um, I, I gotta give I gotta give my full endorsement to go to thirteen oh four. I don't I don't really see any reasons not to at this point. At least that I've run into in the last. Two months, right? Unless uh, unless you have a low resource machine, you might want to maybe test that a little bit. Yeah. But I think overall, I think you'd be okay. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's there's some interesting there's some interesting questions about where they're going to go in the uh, future. The mm-hmm. chat room's got some great points. Uh, like hard HW Killer in the chat room says maybe they'll just scrap the software center and integrate uh, all of it into uh, the dash. And you know you can already do I, some. I, 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 well, I think that's where they're going now. I mean, with so much of this lensy stuff. It's you know? so like here I could actually yeah. uninstall an application right. from the dash, and it's actually a lot smoother. I, I that's how I would do, and that's actually how I would handle their uh, app purchases. Frankly, do it in the dash. You know, look at this. So you know? I gotta say, the search is really quite a bit faster. So yeah. if I search for Bitcoin, here's some suggestions on stuff I could buy that are Bitcoin related. Like, look, here's a 50 gigahertz miner. For thirty five for thirty six hundred dollars oh, on hey, Amazon, you know, <laughs> and I can just click that and it'll take me to Amazon. I, you know, I don't. This isn't this isn't for me. I don't need this in my desktop. But this functionality is very slick now. It works mm-hmm. well. So if this was potentially an App Store interface, maybe. yeah, exactly. And especially if they're able to refine their in their in app purchases, I think that's the big thing. It's less of the pop up and more of the slide. I, if that makes sense to you. Yeah. I, I, it's just more fluid. I think that might work out for them. Same back end, just new front end. So you've been using OpenSUSE a lot oh, lately. Oh, yeah, I've been using that where do you Where do you see the big contrast between these two right now for you? Well, using it as a desktop user. Uh, right. A, a lot of people, and a lot of people have actually jumped on the OpenSUSE bandwagon since I've jumped on. And my biggest point would be that it's not, not everything's going to be just run out of the box ready to go. There are some refinements and things that you need to tweak and adjust to on get. Sousa? Oh yeah, just yeah. M- very minor things, but they're easy enough to do. Um, outside of that, once you get it set up, the one thing I really like about OpenSUSE is ju- it just works really, really well. Um, I've been very, very happy with it. So I think yeah. if you're a power user, definitely check it out. If you're I don't a newbie, know. I, mean, I I don't know. I think all distros have kind of gotten to the point where once you get them set, they run very, very well. Depend. Yeah. The advantage, and and I'm just putting this out there. This is just without judgment. But if you're trying sure. to consider why I would use Ubuntu 1304 over, say, Arch or OpenSUSE, right. I still believe the advantage to Ubuntu is it it is it is it, they they splurge in some areas, they remain conservative in other areas, sure, sure. and you have that broad software compatibility. That no, the, yeah, software compatibility is definitely there. Although and I now will the say, performance too. Yeah. You combine the two. Performance, performance is good. Performance is definitely excellent. Yeah. No, I you know. I, I definitely think it's something you probably want to run both and kind of see where you fit. I will say that out of the box, Ubuntu is going to be easier. Oh, without sure. question, you're going to have less tweaking. The the, the not installation process thing. is very straightforward. Sure. It's it's like down to three or four clicks now if you just yeah. do all of the suggested auto, automated tasks. And the live CD lets you test it out before you go. Mm-hmm. Uh, so. You know, I, I think at this point, if you know if you know Ubuntu, you know what you're going to get. Right. And thirteen oh four is just probably. I mean, maybe I'm being a little too bold here, but I think thirteen oh four might be. The best implementation of it yet. I think it exceeds 1204. I, a lot of people have compared it to, I, it's either 1004 or 1010. I think I would compare it to more 1010, probably in that space to where it's just really solid and you kind of know what you're getting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, you know, it, it's worth checking out. I definitely think it's worth checking out. If you're an Ubuntu person, go for it. Otherwise, if you're bored to tears, check something else out. Give yeah. it a shot. See what you think. Yeah. There's been there's been improvements to a lot of different areas to the panel. There's a lot of nice things here in the panel now. Uh, sure. All small stuff, but uh, go take a look. Definitely. And uh, let us know what you think. Send us in some feedback. Linux Action Show at jupiterbroadcasting.com. <laughs> what do you think of Ubuntu 1304? Mm. Is it boring or is it awesome? Exactly. Maybe, you know what? A lot of, like you do all the time. Maybe the way to go is uh, as they make this transition down the down, you know, uh, redoing Unity and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Hang out in KDE. Hang out in XFCE. Right. Use the Ubuntu base. It never hurts to diversify your options, just in case. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. All right, Matt. That's the Linux Action Show's look at Ubuntu thirteen oh four. Now hold on. When you say no facial hair, have you really given it a go? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I haven't shaved in two weeks. Are you? No, you're kidding me right now. I'm you're, not kidding you. You look like, and now this could be the Skype fuzz, but no, you look I, as I smooth. Can feel the fish fuzz and everything, except it's, it's splotchy and I have a bald spot right here. So that gives you like a perma young look almost. Yes. Yeah. And it sucks when I go for a job interview and say, hey, I know Linux. And they're like, yeah, right. You're a kid. No, you don't look like a kid. I'm just saying. Yeah. No. Well, Brian, so, um, Brian, you are going to join me on a, a segment that uh, is in my slash Etsy. Uh, so I have this new segment on the Linux Action Show called slash Etsy. And it's just whatever I feel like putting in it. Uh, that's the Etsy directory. You know, could be config files, uh, yeah, could be random like interviews. Mostly config files. But yeah. Well, yeah. I don't, in fact, they might as well just call it slash config. But that's not what the show is about. So right. it works. Right. You know? Um, right. So. Et cetera. You know, I wanted to get you on here because. Especially the week that we're we're gonna have this air, we'll be reviewing Ubuntu thirteen oh four. Right. And I thought I'd ask you a couple tough questions up front, and then as my beer gets lower and I get a little drunk, 
Uh, then I'll start giving you the softballs, okay? Okay. All right. So let's uh, before we get into that, let me start with uh, let me start with this segment sponsor. Do you know I have a segment sponsor for this? I'm really actually pretty excited about. This, this is why I'm able to do this. Uh, this segment is sponsored by Untangle. Now you guys know Untangle because we've talked about them for a little bit. Linux powered firewall that you put on the edge, either on an appliance or you download the ISO from the Untangle website. You know, the thing that really strikes me about Untangle is the only multifunction firewall vendor that sells directly to their customers from their website. Now, let me tell you, as an IT guy, I appreciate that. It lets you get in there. You don't have to haggle with the sales guy. You don't have to wait for him to get the quote back and get in there 24, hour to, 24 hours a day and see the price. And of course, whenever you're over at Untangle, if you're looking at their different products and services, maybe you've downloaded their ISO image and you want to try them out, Use the code LAST20 when you check out and save 20% off your purchase of the Untangle services. I am a longtime Untangle user, used it for years. It's great in, in companies where they have maybe not the most robust network knowledge, all the way up to the pro, because it's Linux under that thing, and you guys all know about that. So go check out Untangle.com, and if you end up buying some services, use the code LAST20. But if nothing else, download that ISO. Check it out. Load it on a machine. Put it in a VM. Why not, right? All right, Brian. So, Brian, welcome to the show, man. Hello. Hello there. Now, uh, so I thought, uh, let's say, people might not know if they haven't followed the show for a long time. Brian, you go by Brian2040 in our Brian IRC chat room. Yeah. Yep. And sometimes, sometimes I like to have a little extension or lack of extension. People have been <laughs> complaining that I've lost my numbers. Oh, well. And, and then people then complain. It's like, whoa, you're not at work. You're not, you're not on your laptop. Where are you? Um, so, you know, the thing that, uh, uh, that really sticks out about, about you from the IRC chat room is uh, you've been creating a distro now for years. And uh, yeah, about a little over a year. No, it's been longer than that. No, it's it's been around November of 2011. So I you've seen I, you've seen some uh, you've seen some pretty good adoption then in that amount of time. So maybe that's why I thought it was a little longer because I, I just I don't know I, I I've seen it spread around. It's called Descent OS for those of you who are familiar with and. Uh, uh, you originally started, if I recall, as an Ubuntu derivative. Very germane yes. to today's yes. episode. No longer the case, though, is it? No, it's uh, it's Debian now. Now, why is that? Um, I'm not exactly sure on the direction Ubuntu wants to make, and also I enjoy working with the Debian base more hmm. since it's my project. I am the dictator, and I I do what I like. So that's kind of funny. As being... It's also been a new experience. I mean, I'm I'm not exactly looking for, you know. If I wanted to differentiate myself, I, I really did need to ditch the Ubuntu base. A, because I want to have more control over what I did. Yeah. And Debian, Debian, Debian is pretty much designed to be either a very stable platform or a base for another distro. You know, that's so. a great point. And it's funny because what you're kind of doing is you're exercising the freedoms you have as, <laughs> as a small distribution, kind of like I do a lot of times. Uh, when I do stuff on Jupiter Broadcasting, because it's, you know, I kind of call the shots, so I get to make the decisions, and that's the advantage you have. But uh, let me ask you something. Okay. What do you think the practical reality is of you ever being competitive with the with distros the size of OpenSUSE, Arch, and Ubuntu? Do you really ever, do you aspire to be that size? Do you do you actually think that's going to happen? Uh, I, th I think every developer does. I think the main thing is just finding something different. You know, mm -hmm. finding something that people maybe are a little bit curious of. And then, you know, once they try, they're like, hey, that's kind of cool. I might, you know, want to show it to my friend or I might want to re review it on a podcast or something. Yeah. And then, and then you know, that people see, see people start using it. They're like, hey, that's not bad. And, you know, people download it. I mean, I got into DistroWatch. My, my uh, download skyrocketed the first day I got into DistroWatch, and that was amazing. Um you know, it's just people, it's, you have to give something that, that feels fresh, but maybe a little bit familiar. Yeah. And yeah, that's and kind of your thing, isn't it? You kind of, you yeah. kind of focused on yeah. a little more of the traditional design, but moved it forward too. Right. Yeah. Um, I've added some, I've added some applications. I've, I've forked, um, this old, uh, version of Slingshot, which was this Mac OS 10 style launcher. And I, I, for, I forked that into something called Vision, but it's it's been very fun learning Vela in order to service it, and then um, you know I try to get a little bit of a known three inf influence in it. I had a, <laughs> yeah, I mean because it's a new paradigm of desktop environments. Yeah. People love like people love the flash, you know. People the, love the whiz bang features. <laughs> yeah, people people love when you click on a button, all these applications just splash onto your screen, and yeah, you know. And I I do want to I do like doing that part of desktop 
development, except I also like at the end of the day, people have to get work done, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. sometimes, you know, click on the top left corner and then clicking four things just to launch Firefox is just not going to do it's it. It's too much, right? Yeah. So, yeah, OK. Absolutely. I mean, so what you're basically telling me is you, you, you try to find areas you can differentiate and then hope that those are qualities that drive enough people to find you that basically organically boost discovery and you, your growth. But do you get frustrated when um, I don't know if I don't remember exactly when Elementary OS launched, but uh, it's it's been relatively recent that Elementary OS launched, and it's seen probably a pretty good amount of success. Does that kind of thing, when you see another distro kind of come along after you've been around, so say, or just theoretically, do you get discouraged from that, or do you look at what they're doing and say, yeah, maybe I'll do some of that? I mean, where do you fall down on that? Well, you have to know your competition, you know. I mean, I use, I try out different dif- distributions to get inspiration or figure out what I don't want to do. You know, I have to, I have to know exactly what other people's ideas are in order to kind of incorporate my own into it. Hmm. I see. Because so it's kind of like inspiration know, in a sense. Oh no, you know, you could keep going. No, I mean, do you kind of consider like, do you look at the other projects, see what they're doing, and kind of consider that a source of inspiration? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> you know, it's it's that's a that's a good precipice of uh open source software you see something you want to make it better and then you go and you make it better and then you release it and then people have other people go and make it better and then release it so there's of course something else you're doing to try to drive the growth of your independent distribution is you're joining us at linux fest northwest this year you're gonna you're gonna be there and sort of selling the brand selling the distro right yeah, I'm. I'm gonna go and talk to people and see. You know, let them get get their own opinions. You know, I'm. I consider myself a pretty social person. I can talk to people, so it's it'll, it'll be fun for me because I actually get to be around people who like to use Linux and maybe want to try mm-hmm. something new or want to have something that feels a little bit more familiar, especially for people because there's a lot of system administrators out there. Yeah, and you know, I'm I'm a sysadmin myself, so I like to get work done. You know. Yeah, I like. To, I don't use Node three at work. I use actually my distro, which kind of inflates my ego a little bit. But <laughs> um, hey, man, if I made a distro, I'd use it too. <laughs> absolutely, but you know, at the end of the day, you gotta get work done. And I think that my distro caters to the more advanced users as well as the beginners. Yeah. So you know, I'm trying to make a distro that everyone can pick up and say, "Okay, I can use this." Right. Right. And uh, I think you're doing a great job. So it's uh, Descent OS, and uh, people can go over to uh, DescentOS.org and check out uh, the uh, ISOs and the screenshots. And, of course, you're on Twitter, too. What's your Twitter handle? Uh, at Descent OS. It's, uh, I'm very creative with my usernames. That's pretty good. It's pretty clear. And, you know, uh, how do you feel like if uh, people try out the distro, do uh, you mind if they uh, pop you a few questions if they have them in the uh, no, uh, Jupyter no, Broadcasting no, feel, chat? Feel free to email me. I have a support channel app in the uh, Oh, okay. In- um, in uh, my beta of my distribution, Descent OS 4, that's a, that's a Debian-based one. All right, well, um, so there's yeah, like a... All it a... does is connect out to my uh, IRC chat room. Oh, okay. Well, there you go. That works. Yeah. 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 You, can, you can contact me directly. I am on IRC everywhere I go, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah, I've noticed. <laughs> if you have any support questions, feel free to ask me. There are other people who are willing to help you as well. And if, if, if you have a personal question to ask me, feel free to email me. My email is all over my blog. There you go. You know. And go check out uh, Descent OS over at DescentOS.org. And, of course, be sure to say hi to Brian at Linux Fest Northwest next weekend. And, uh, Brian, we'll have to go out and get some beers or have a lunch or something like that, okay? <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. All right, man. Well, I'll see you next weekend. brings us to the end of this week's show and you know it's interesting we're watching the chat room between the segment and uh like cheeseburg says yeah maybe just wait for 1404 that's when Mm -hmm. the big change on the desktop is going to happen and you know i said at the beginning of that last segment i said i've been really worried about this review because it's kind of gotten to the point it's like what the hell do we talk about yeah it's ubuntu it's it is what it is it's it's great for that but as they kind of begin to focus on mobile and stuff, it just seems like they're just kind of moving it forward a little bit. They're not really kind of innovating and making these big, huge leaps that we yeah, all would like we, to see. We talked about it. things kind of plateauing yeah. out. Uh, There's just not a lot of something for us to sit down and go, holy crap, check out X. It's so amazing. Right. Finally, they're breaking through this barrier that we've all been waiting for. It's like, no, we've... 
we've kind of started to break through that barrier. But instead of it being one big, huge, oh my gosh, splash, it's this slow, small, step by step process. And we're just kind of watching it unfold. Now, when you look back at it from years from now, it'll be obvious where the sure. big moments were. But for now, you know, we kind of look at it and go, okay. You have to hold a stick up to see it move. I mean, it really, for lack of a better term, yeah. that's really what it is. I think that over time, as things like a mirror and things like that begin to become baked into it, that's funny. It'll be interesting. Thought the black says sometimes you got to let off the gas when you're changing gears. Hmm. Wow, that's that's, that's some deep wisdom, that's actually. Deep. <laughs> <laughs> that's some, wow, that's really deep wisdom. Yeah. Well said. I, I guess my final word mm. on it is do it for the speed. Yeah. Do it, if you're a Unity user, then it's a slam dunk. Sure. All right, Matt, let's get to some feedback. What All do right. I say? Let's do it. So last week, we uh, brought up the topic during the feedback segment of uh, tweaks for SSD mm. performance, and uh, Super Nathan dropped in this thread where he went through a lot of step-by-steps on what oh, he wow. does. He says, hey, after watching the last episode where you guys mentioned posting about your SSD modifications, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I thought I would start. Please feel, please feel free to comment. And he goes through and he, he outlines them. We'll have a link in the show notes. Um, Interesting. There was some back and forth in the comment thread about some people saying that this might just be, you know, sort of just tweaks for tweaks sake. Uh, sure. But then there was a good conversation on different on different uh, uh, different uh, formats oh, okay. and different things to try. Uh, some discussion Benefits on swapping. And causality and all that. Mm-hmm. Or, and also I thought there was an interesting discussion here about adjusting swap and things mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. So. Cool. As a follow-up to the uh, thread we started last week in the show, go check out. We'll have a link to that. If you have an SSD and been wondering if there's tweaks you can make to run a little better or maybe extend its life under Linux, that link might be relevant for you. Zek writes in mm. with a question about the Ubuntu Software Center on Mint. He says, hey, guys, mm-hmm. Zek the Penguin here with a question. Is there a way to install the Ubuntu Software Center on Linux Mint? Probably something simple that I just haven't tried. Yeah. Yeah, there is. If I remember correctly, I believe it's a PPA that you actually have to add because I, oh. I don't believe it's actually in. The... It might be. Yeah. It, it, it depends. It, on... At one time, I think it was. Okay. So, And it's been a long time since I minted it. So but, I, yeah. it might be. It, I think they're using the Ubuntu repos. I think it's in there. But the, oh, okay. the, part that you have to, the part you have to tweak is there is uh, this. I'll link to a script you can download. Oh, we'll do yeah. this for you. But there mm-hmm. is a file that the Software Center checks. And mm-hmm. it's, it's checking to get the, to find out what version of Ubuntu you're using. Right. So then it knows what applications are compatible. And when it checks that file on Mint, it says, oh, well, you're running, you're not running Ubuntu. I can't run. Right. Exactly. Yeah. You can tweak that file. Now, that, sometimes that file breaks other things for Mint. That's why you back up your file. Yeah. You so you can swap it. between them. Yeah. Um, you know, I, we just got done dogging on it. So... <laughs> <laughs> kind of funny that, <laughs> but it is a source of discovery. I would also point out that um, it definitely you're going to find things in the Ubuntu Software Center you might not find in the Linux software store, or it, the yeah. Linux Mint software store rather. I would just say so, go to apps.ubuntu.com yeah. and just use it on the yeah. web. Then then you don't care. Yeah, mm-hmm. th- actually that would be preferable because you still get your discovery and you're getting access to all the apps you're see, looking if I, for. See, if I launch install here, it the only thing is is. Um, you have to have an application registered with the slash apt protocol. Uh, I don't know if you can do that with git deb or um, not git deb. Um, what's the uh, gdeb i? Oh, yeah, 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 gdeb. Yeah, gdeb. G-D-B. I, don't know, I don't know. I'm sure Synaptic can register the uh, sl- uh, apt URL. but I think, yeah, no, I think I think gdeb is how I actually, because I, I don't I'll launch anything with a software center mm-hmm. on Ubuntu. I do everything with gdeb, so I'm pretty sure you can. Phil wrote in. He knows mm. that I have a couple of boxy boxes. Talked about them on the show before. These Jeez. are the little Linux running media centers. Nice. And he writes in. He says uh, the boxy box flash doesn't support or boxy box doesn't support flash eleven. Mm. That has ramifications for those of us in Australia. We can't play most of our free to air TV stations due to this problem. The mm-hmm. D Link boxy box have pulled support only after about two or two to three years after introducing the boxy. And as we all know, this is a big problem. But you can root your boxy box, and there are hacking communities that are more interested in doing more with this device. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So, uh, so he says, does anybody shed a light on whether it may be possible to eventually install less restrictive firmware such as XBMC on their boxy box? So, like we did with the hmm. SSDs, if there's any boxy box owners out there that have replaced yeah. their firmware, who are, or if you've got an XBMC to work on your boxy box, let us know. I would love to. I would love to fix this. Email it. Maybe some screenshots. A video. Hey, whatever you got. You know. Yeah. Jason writes in, and I wanted to cover this one because we actually got a really positive response to our episode last week, Did. the Wirecast problem. Yeah, I was, I was really pleasant. I was, I was actually pretty sure we were going to get trolled hard. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just run behind the track. Oh, there. look at the guys on Linux Action Show are talking about what they can't use Linux for. But we thought it was you know good to be honest sure. and talk about some shortcomings. Mm-hmm. And uh, apparently some other folks did too. Jason wrote in. He said, hey, guys, I just finished watching your Wirecast episode of Linux Action Show, showing the viewers the type of stuff you use to produce the show brought back memories from when I was taking broadcast lessons in high school. 
Uh, and says, you're correct, Mr. Chris. It takes way too much time to render blue or green screen backgrounds. I remember one day helping out our teacher sync all of our little news segments, commercials, and skits, and then render the anchor shots with a blue screen. It took hours and hours just to produce one 30-minute show. Wow. Looking back over those four years and all of the stress and deadlines to make, it sure was fun. Something like Wirecast would have helped us out immensely. And I remember we talked about mm-hmm. one of the reasons we use Wirecast is because it does this live green screen. Yeah, it was just it was a matter of practicality. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He said, but then I realized something, Chris. You have sunk so much of your own money and time into making these shows possible. And I must sincerely thank you and Matt and your other co-hosts for producing and bringing the audience engaging material. That's awesome. Just goes to show you, if you're truly passionate about something and really love it, then you should do it. Who knows? I think I might get back into video production again. Sweet. Thanks for all that you do. Right on. Thanks, Jason. Right on. Thank you. Next email comes in from Anon. It's a funny name. Uh, he says, uh, I'd like to see your your opinions on what it means to be a lightweight desktop. So let's let's bounce this around real okay. quick. Okay. This article came out, what makes a lightweight desktop? And actually a few different places mm. covered it. Uh, Anon linked in uh, Martin's blog. And where Martin, you know, kind of kicks around, what makes a desktop lightweight? Is it the memory usage? Is it the right. CPU usage? Is it compositing? Is it the amount of disk space it takes? To you, Matt, what is it? What makes a lightweight uh, desktop? To me, it has nothing to do with disk uh, dis space, surprisingly to some folks, perhaps. Uh, it has to do with the rendering. It has to do with compositing. It has to do with how much how much physical, uh, you know, processing power. Overhead. And RAM, overhead. Yeah, overhead. Exactly. How much overhead does it actually have to uh, be available to make this happen? And I think that was for me. And more importantly, even if I have a lot of overhead, would I rather use that overhead for something else mm. versus running my desktop? That's a great you know? point. That's one of the reasons I've constantly bumped jumped out of using Unity is yeah. I'll be sitting here working on something and I'll bring up the process model and I'll be like, holy crap, comp is taking way too much CPU usage. Right. That's it, I'm out of here. Exactly. Forget <laughs> that! <laughs> Screw I, you guys! And I throw now. the table over, yeah. right? Totally. Uh, so, for me, lightweight is always relative to the computer I'm using on. There is no desktop that is heavyweight on right. the Bonobo, right? So there's, yeah. like, for me... Yeah, so you're spoiled. It's so pointless. You there's, care. like, zero point to a lightweight <laughs> desktop. Now, on an older computer, yes. you know, I'll, I'll often bust out XFCE or, K, or LXDE oh. because I feel like those are, overall, it's like a, it's an accumulation of less memory. Totally. You can dedicate CPU. that the same resources to something you care about. Like my web browsing. Yeah, totally, right? Yeah. All right, so I want to get to uh, a video question, and then we just have a couple of things before we get out of here, cool, okay? Cool, cool, All right, this is actually more like video feedback, and it was sent in by Richard, or Rickard? Hi there, Matt and Chris. My name is uh, Rickison. Rickison. And, um, yeah, I'm a huge fan of your shows. Uh, I watch uh, Linux Action Show and um, uh, TechSnap. And, uh, yeah, I saw the last episode recently, and I thought I'd... Uh, I thought I had something uh, interesting to say, maybe, uh, since I work in video production and I use Linux every day. Uh, of course, I do not do broadcasting like you, and I totally understand why I use Wirecast, because there really isn't anything for Linux that would work in your situation. But I thought I might uh, share a little bit about what does work and uh, how I use it, or what I use. Uh, just a little quick. Uh, so. I must say though that FFmpeg is uh, king. It's uh, so much better than everything else that is in the transcoding market. Of course, it's only command line, but I work with it always. I use it for everything. I use it for Blu-ray encoding, DVD encoding, uploading to the internet, or uh, making stuff for transmission, broadcast masters, and uh, yeah, basically for everything you could imagine. Uh, because it's so, um, it's because it's so advanced. It's kind of like the Linux of video encoders. I used to use Episode when I used to work at a bigger post-production facility, but well, FFmpeg is still a lot better, I think. Uh, anyways, I actually use it right now to capture. Oh, my screen. screen cap. Uh, I also use uh, some effect programs uh, like Nuke. Have a, yeah, this is uh, just a still image from... How is he doing this in real time? ...that I took oh, earlier, and it uh, kind of works like After Effects. Uh, Ooh. But it's well, uh, with notes instead of layers, and notes are maybe much superior. Or superior. Uh, then yeah. there are, you know, this expensive applications that like Autodesk good. Flame that also run only on Linux, this mm-hmm. one. Uh, it's a Red Hat only, and it's uh, like two hundred thousand dollars. Oh my gosh! Buy, so it's wow, two hundred thousand dollars. 
Well, not I'll very write price. a check right now. Compellent. Oh, man, let's... And uh, there are other applications as well as uh, this, uh, you know, color grading applications like this Luster and DaVinci Ooh. Resolve, which is kind of a cool system I used to work with also. There's some good uh, uh, picture porn here for you, uh, video listeners. In real life. Yeah. Um, and of course, uh, some 3D applications like Maya. It's also Autodesk, but uh, Maya works on basically any Linux version. Uh, and uh, I use uh, Blender, though, for my 3D needs. Patch your poop. Uh, you might recognize this uh, little scene from TechSnap. Um, and then for color grading, uh, I use uh, SpeedGrade, because it works on basically any Linux version oh, as wow. well. Wow. However, it's uh, no longer being developed for Linux, because Adobe bought SpeedGrade, mm. and that sucks. But yeah use an old version and of course lightworks you all know about lightworks already and uh, apparently crashed for me this morning um, so yeah that's uh, video production tools for Linux that does work really well and uh, that I use right on not all nice. of them but a lot of them uh, every day so yeah that was a great that video great. tutorial. Hi there, Matt and Chris. Oh, hi. Oh, hi. My name is oh, uh, Rickison. Oh, hi, hi Rickison. So thank you, Rickison, for sending that in. Yeah. Uh, it was interesting because he showed us the whole other side, sort of the, the there's a whole in, we are in a completely different type of video industry where it's live right. to tape and then it is, it's it's released as fast as possible. Exactly. He's in the set it just right, color grade the scene you want, get everything in there, rent, you take have time. The, take the time, yeah. make quality, that sort of and thing. And isn't it interesting there that that's where Linux is really strong? Yes. I mean, he mentioned in that clip there that he has a $200,000 piece of software that requires Red Hat. Yeah. Whoa! Yeah. Oh. Uh, woo. Woo, right? Wow. So, you know wow. what? Just goes to show you that uh, just because it doesn't work in some environments, that's true. Doesn't mean it's not being used somewhere else. Now, Matt, uh, <laughs> you got to uh, you got to dust off your monkey suit here, Matt. I got some uh, I got I got some bad news for you. Uh, I want to introduce you to I think it's called the Maui project, maybe like for, yeah, you know, and uh, from like Hawaii or whatever. The, yeah. the Maui project is a Wayland-based desktop that allows you to use Wayland. Oh man. And test it. right here. Look at this. <laughs> Look at this right uh, here. They got a pretty nice menu. I actually kind of yeah. like this desktop. I kind of want to try this desktop, and it is powered by Wayland. <laughs> vote so, here. Vote here. So for those of you who don't know, uh, there is a bit of a bet going on the Linux Action Show, and the bet is is uh, that that uh, Mir will ship before Wayland, and Matt has waged a monkey suit. Yes, on the I line. have. I so have. We will see. And there is a uh, artist representation of what that will look like. So uh, <laughs> we have a video in the show notes. Uh, thanks to Blackout yes. Twenty Four for submitting that, and you can go over to Maui-Project.org oh. if you would like to. Uh, That's cool. Yeah, there it is. Not cool for me, but it's cool no, for you. Not cool for cool you. For you. Not cool not for you. Cool for you. Now here's something that is cool for you. Oh, okay. This is another thread that we've. Been, this is like all these threads. We're just I like, like we're this. wrapping yeah. up on a lot of threads that have been throughout the last few weeks. That's pretty cool. Uh, Jedi Outcast oh, yes. for Linux. There's actual code that you can go download off GitHub right now. Don't forget, you need the original assets. Yes. But if you have the Jedi Knight 2 Jedi Outcast assets, mm -hmm. you can download actual functioning code. It's been tested on Ubuntu 12.10, I believe. Um, and it, you just need to uh, just drop the assets into mm -hmm. one of the directories here. He's got all the instructions that you need to follow. Yeah. And Just uh, check out the readme. You'll be all right. Start playing. Totally. So I, I believe this is... So th it was... Two or three weeks ago, we announced that they were open sourcing, yeah, and here like, we are. This is that fast progression you were talking about I earlier. It. I love you know, it. It's, okay. it's, it's still early days, so totally. expect some problems. One last thing before we get out of here. It's a bit of a downer. Mm. Four days left for the Gary Project. Uh. Now, you guys, this is important to me. This, this is how I read your feedback. We need this project to continue. Uh, look, if you want a good email client, I know there's other ones out there. I know there's webmail. They all suck. None of them are as good as Gary, but it needs to get better. We'll have a link to the Indiegogo campaign. Yep. If you want to toss them a few bucks, they have four days left. They've raised $41,000 out of their $100,000 goal. Yeah. I mean, you know, worst case, the way I see it is you can either do it a couple ways. You can either uh, drop them a few bucks, or if you're a multimillionaire, you can just go ahead and write them a check for about 60. <laughs> you're good, you know? <laughs> I hope they make it. They're doing a fixed funding, so if they don't make it, they're not, they're not getting the money. Yeah, and I... I and I'm with Chris on this. I'd, I'd really like to see this uh, mature. So yeah, 
Throw him a couple bucks. Uh, we'll see what happens. <sighs> I think the problem is that you're you're in a space, you know, crowdfunding. You're in a space that people are competing with glitz and glamour and flash. Gmail, Outlook.com. Yeah. Well, I mean, but, but, I mean, just as far as funding is concerned, it's like oh. okay, it's an email client versus yeah. this really cool game or this oh, amazing or, circuit board that does this great stuff. I mean, you look at what you get with the uh, with the Ouya and that and that Arduino board we showed earlier. Yeah. They just the hardware just yeah. is it gets above and beyond. Funding. So it's tough to yeah. you know c- uh, compete with that. So I think and that and the rewards really have to be pretty compelling. Yeah, we'll have a link. It's over so, at Indiegogo. If uh, if you want it before the show is over, you can just search for Gary. But uh, otherwise, just look for. Uh, the link in the show notes. Yep. Matt, what are you up to this week? Where people find what you're doing? I do stuff over datamation.com. You just go datamation. Hoo-wee. Scroll on down there. there op- open there near their source and uh, click on my stuff. And as always, you can find me on uh, Facebook at uh, Matt Hartley Matt Public. Public. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, something like that. Uh, <laughs> quick plug, if you're fast on your toes, if you're watching this, I think you have until Tuesday. We're going to send out a brand new edition of the Jupiter Signal, our biggest yep. edition of the Jupiter Signal ever. Yep, 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 yep. We yep. have I just I just proofread it last night. We have it stuff in there about Linux Fest Northwest. We got yep. stuff in there about the Plan B, but we're also introducing something new. Oh, and I'll just here's a tease. <laughs> commuters are gonna love it. Oh hey, wow. Non commuters will be, love it too. That Absolutely. Could be cool. That but could be if cool. you're a commuter, you're really gonna love it. So go to bit.ly slash Jupiter Signal if you'd like to sign up for the Jupiter Broadcasting monthly newsletter. Mm-hmm. We only send one newsletter a month. We, Literally. Yep. We promise not to spam because no. if we spam, angry monkeys will come and beat us. So I'm not saying, you know, it could be a lot of things. It could be a lot of things, but uh, check, uh, you got, you'll have to be a subscriber to the Jupiter Signal to get yes. the new thing we'll be introducing. Again, that's bit.ly slash Jupiter Signal. All right? That's right. That's right. Okay, well, so next week is the big Linux Fest Northwest Ooh, yeah. weekend. Don't forget to tune in live on Saturday. Mm-hmm. I don't know when. Probably we'll, after we'll connect throughout like the week and figure it out. Yeah. Eleven a.m. Pacific. Yeah, yeah I don't, it's, 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 we're gonna follow. The, I can't say this enough. Follow the calendar on the page. Mm-hmm. Follow. The, that's where yeah. any updates, changes, tweaks. Follow also the good calendar. Twitter. The Twitter's, Twitter's good. Twitters because if yeah. we're like you know if we're if we're leaving to like go grab lunch, we'll probably totally. tweet it out. Uh, so yeah, um, any social yeah, Twitter's good. Mm-hmm. Uh, the calendar's good. We Google have links Plus, to all of that yeah. in the show notes. So if you're going to be at Linux Fest yep. and you want to track us down, which why wouldn't you? Just uh, use those resources. We've got them all there for you guys. Yep. All right, and uh, don't forget you can check out Plan B. And uh, other than that, man, that's the whole show. I think that's it. All right, everyone, thanks so much for tuning this week's episode of the Linux Action Show. We'll see you right back here next week. Cheers. Hey, how about instead of doing last, we just watch Mario videos? Okay. Slips. You know me. I am way too classy. I would never in a million years, not only would I not put up a picture of a unicorn, but I wouldn't have a picture of a unicorn <laughs> just all of a sudden ready to go. Why would I? I would not Is that do that. Is that a technical difficulty yeah, shot there? like that? I like that. That's oh, Twitter. You think you're still relevant. Isn't that adorable? 257 of the Good Linux action grief. shows. I think we're like on year 912 now.